Okay, I'm back. Um, so I, I um, wanted to speak about something that a lot of people talk about, you know, just in everyday life. Um, I, I can't remember the last time I ran home to catch a TV show. I can't remember the last time I had to get home to watch the 6 o'clock or the 9 o'clock news. Um, and everybody's sort of in the same boat. And it's not just exclusive to Chinese media, but Chinese media and Asian media, but specifically Chinese media, has, has their own uh, challenges. The, uh, can I get to the next slide? I want to explain, first of all, the business of media, because a lot of people don't understand what the business of media is. So the business of media traditionally is you have a medium, which could be print, radio, newspaper, and you create stories. It could be news, it could be editorial, um, you know, in some cases, like, uh, I don't know, like those magazines that people used to buy in the 80s, like Reader's Digest, that would be uh, uh, fictional stories, adventure stories, and then people would read that. They may pay a little bit to buy that publication or to access that radio station or TV station, but most of the funding would then come from advertising. So it's a little bit of a chicken-egg thing. You don't have the content, you don't have the advertising. You don't have the advertising, you can't pay people to do the content. So that's essentially the business of media. Let's get to the next slide. So I'm gonna give you a brief history um, in diversity media. In the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, if anybody said, we'd like to do multicultural advertising, essentially what they were saying was, we'd like to do Chinese advertising. Mm -hmm. um, there had always been, for example, um, Chin Radio, which had a bulk of its programming in Italian. Um, but if you look at the history of Italian Canadians and, and, and even Japanese Canadians, their assimilation process actually happened over such a long period of time that many Italian Canadians, while they still embrace their culture, a lot of the youth, they don't even speak Italian. So a lot of the so-called Italian programming was actually Italian people, people speaking in English to Italian people. Um, and, and so that really was the basis of Chin Radio, but Chin pioneered something. They pioneered what was, you know, they, they basically had carved out a niche called multicultural advertising. Back then, um, in the late 80s, uh, I was just finishing up school, but I started to get to know the multicultural media landscape. And by the time I got into the industry myself, which was in the early 90s, uh, things were really starting to heat up. So um, at that time, we had a number of newspapers here for, that, that were focused on the Chinese community. We had a newspaper here that, that disappeared after, but it was Sing Pao. We had Sing Tao. We had a World Journal, a Taiwanese paper. Um, and then in the early 90s, another paper from Hong Kong, Ming Pao, opened up, which is still here today. And, um, and essentially, Back then, there was also, uh, everybody knows Omni Television. Back then, it was called CFMT. And they were a cable um, uh, uh, channel that had multilingual programming, but all the primetime slots seemed to be reserved for Cantonese programming. And there was a, uh, a radio station called CCBC. It was supposed to sound kind of like CBC, but it was the Chinese Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And you had to actually go to Chinatown and buy a radio that could pick up the frequency that was broadcasting on CCBC. So, you know, you weren't gonna get any commuters, that's for sure, because this radio had a plug that went into the wall. And so you would sit at home, and, 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 and I remember when I first started my company, we would convince people, oh yeah, definitely, people are sitting in the kitchen watching the radio. And they didn't have a lot of listeners, they didn't have a lot of viewers, but they were the only game in town at that time. And really, the purpose of, uh, of, of uh, but let's get, get to the name of the next one. So the purpose of multicultural media at that time was that if you came here to Canada, you weren't able to get um, news from back home. You weren't able to watch programs from back home unless you tuned in. Really, how, how was that possible? Because there was no internet. So unless you were having somebody ship over VHS tapes or beta, beta tapes uh, to watch uh, TV shows that were pre-recorded, really the only content you could get was either through radio, television, or print. And back then, print 
well, the journalists were essentially giving stories and information from back home, but they were also giving local stories um, that all the other mainstream news stations were covering, but they were giving it to you with a sort of a local view from a, from a, a Chinese lens, let's say. And they would probably put more emphasis on uh, stories that might have appealed to people from, the, from Asia at that time. So that covers basically, you know, uh, uh, radio and television and, um, uh, and print. And that really was all there was. Can I have the next slide, please? So in broadcasting, it was television. Back then, you could get away with taking an English commercial with a Western family, just throw in a dub or some subtitles and have Cantonese coming out of their mouth, and that would literally pass for a Chinese ad. And that literally was the backbone of CFMT. At the time, you pay a one-shot price, they'll do all the, the, the not even lip syncing, like it was just a really bad voiceover. And, um, and that was basically what qualified as advertising at that time. But it did do the job, because remember, if it's the only game in town, then you really have no other choice. Print, print was huge. So what happened was, right around the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, we started to see a ton of Chinese print. Um, some of you may recall that Maclean's magazine had a Chinese version. Uh, there's not even an English version anymore. Uh, Toronto Life had a Chinese version. There's no Toronto Life anymore. But they, they're, they're, they literally were clamoring to try and reach the Chinese audience because remember there was no other way. I remember I, I mean I nobody was on the internet yet. I was still using a CompuServe account, and um, and and there really was no other way to not only get your news, but to also advertise the people that were listening to that content. So why did all this happen? So all of this basically happened because of immigration. So many of you may have actually come over during that time or earlier, but there was the largest wave of immigration that Canada had ever experienced. In fact, they had opened up quite a new uh, number of immigration offices just to, accompany, uh, to accommodate the number of people coming over from Hong Kong at the time. And so marketers back then, they, and media as well, they, they really didn't do the numbers properly. I mean, if you, if you uh, looked at the rate card for McLean's Chinese, um, it was probably a thousand times more expensive than advertising in the, in the English version. But it didn't really matter because everybody heard that people from Hong Kong had a lot of money and they want to advertise and they want to sell them watches and cars and, you know, and life insurance and all the rest. Right? But essentially immigration is what drove the frenzy of multicultural advertising. And it grew into this very, very large field. Um, there were, and when, you, when you've got a lot of media, you've got a lot of content. When you've got a lot of content, you need advertisers. When you have advertisers, you then need ad agencies to create the ads and it basically support this entire industry. Well, what happened then was there was a little bit of a mini collapse. Um, uh, everybody sort of gained their senses back. And um, when they realized, well, a lot of people actually had gone back to Hong Kong. Uh, because when Hong Kong was essentially handed back over to China, they, they realized there really was no need to panic. And a lot of people did settle here, but a lot of people also went back. And the media started to settle down. Let's get to the next slide. So I kind of call this the steady years. And the steady years actually lasted around about five or six years, around 2000 to 2005. And actually that was a great time, these, th this period of time. This period of time when it came to multicultural advertising was when people actually built real business plans around starting a magazine, starting a newspaper, starting a radio station. It was at that time that we saw some great publications that are still here today, um, especially in South Asian media. And I have to say, South Asian media is very strong in Canada. Um, they have papers like um, uh, The Weekly Voice, which is uh, printed also by the Toronto Star. They've got South Asian Focus, which is a Metroland paper. I don't know if you've ever seen Anoki magazine. It's like a, it's a primo, like a high-end entertainment style magazine. And they really, during this period of time, uh, Chinese media, South Asian media really started to settle in and, and uh, media buyers started to take them seriously. Because in the media world, if you're about to advertise and somebody says, this is our audience, like an experienced marketer is going to say, can you please prove that you have 100,000 people, you know, reading your newspaper. Uh, during the frenzy time, nobody was auditing anything. Um, but if you run a real magazine, 
uh, or a real radio station, you will hire a third party company to audit your numbers and actually say that the numbers are what they are. And so during this particular period, uh, Chinese media started to spend money to become audited and be able to prove to marketers that yes, in fact, you are, this is your cost to reach a thousand people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can I get the next slide? So these are just an example of, of tons of the media that, that came about and as dot-com started to grow, we, there's a great site called mybindi.com and uh, they, we started to see, you know, websites start um, uh, really like taking the audience, studying the audience, studying Asians in Canada, what do they want, what do they need, um, you know, what do they, what do they want to buy. So when, when they would approach a marketer, they would say, you know, this is exactly who we, who we target. The content was also reflective of that. They actually spent money on content. I remember when you would hold a press conference and the Chinese media literally, they would send out not just a reporter, they'd send out a reporter, they'd send out a cameraman. I, I remember there were, you know, times they'd even send out a sound person. And they really, I mean, it was really a big deal and they really did a great job. Next slide. Then this happened. So when the digital evolution happened, everybody started to ask what exactly is local content? What, I mean, and, and what, is, what is content? Never mind what's local content, what is content? So if you're a reporter for a newspaper and you say you're the automotive specialist and that newspaper has 100,000 readers, but I'm a blogger and I'm just writing from home about cars and I have a million people following me, who's more authoritative? Is it me or is it you just because you work for a newspaper? In fact, this is where the digital evolution has completely taken everything and turned it completely upside down on its head. So immigrants coming over now, now they no longer need to go through those local channels to access programming, to access news, to access their favorite shows, and to communicate with others. This has changed everything, not just in Chinese media, but I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but this has changed everything for the entire world. Um, you know, we are seeing, we have, we have newspaper reps that come to us and for the same amount that we paid about 10 years ago, they're giving us almost eight times the number of ads in the same, in the same media, media bucket for the same dollars as, eight, as uh, a decade ago. They're giving us eight times the value. So that is how they can hardly even give away this stuff, especially when it comes to print. But the problem here is, is that they can't abandon their existing business models because they don't know exactly what to do. The problem is we've been getting the internet for free for so many years and when you've given us something for free for so many years, it's very tough to get me to pay for it. I mean, how many people here see an article come up on the news and then it says, if you want to read more, click here and subscribe? Yeah, do you subscribe? <laughs> exactly, nobody subscribes, right? I mean, I love, I love the, world, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times have great stories and the moment I see that paywall, I'm just like, you know what, somebody's got to have this story, like somebody else, for free. And they usually do. Um, can I go to the next slide? 